So, hello. Um, I'm here at WOMAD. Um, my name is Skeena Rathor, and I'm the Vision uh, Team Coordinator for Extinction Rebellion. And I have sat many times between Roger and Gail, and um, this is why, perhaps, I'm here talking to you about to introduce uh, part of the debrief, which was very special for a great number of people. And it was special because um, Extinction Rebellion is about moral leadership and it's about moral impeccability. It's about truth-telling. Um, a a truth-telling that brings us right to, um, to draw on some uncomfortable parts of ourselves, to, to, to explain those to each other, to name what's going on, to name where our relationships are, are becoming difficult and painful, um, and also to name where, where the synergy and where the joy, where the meeting points are. And I think that moment in the debrief um, spoke to something that is true for all of us which is that when, when we show our leadership and we stand with others in that leadership, how do we navigate so that we hold each other in our, in our most exquisite leadership? How, how do we and, and, and draw each other to account and name where it's not fitting, where respect misses a beat? And I think that moment that you're about to watch is, is that, is two people trying to name what they're bringing, what they dream of bringing, and what they have bought, and at where it's been very difficult, agony at some points. There's a moment where Gail speaks about someone in our movement, um, Ronan, describing them as the sun and the moon. And in that, mo in that moment, in that narrative, which um, I think some people have heard a few times, the rest of us can wonder who we are. And I think that's why um, I am so happy to be able to speak to you, because I want to say to people that are watching this, that we are co-leaders, and that if there is a sun and a moon, then you are the stars and the sky. And you're, we're holding all of this together. There's a co-leadership, and there is leadership causing leadership. And more than anything, in this moment of time, in our impending collapse, as we face the possibility of, of our extinction, then, wow, do we need the kind of leadership from, from the very place in our hearts that can transform these last moments, if they are to be our last moments, into a place of love and respect and feeling and um, a heraldship, heralding what is is possible so let's cause that in each other let's cause an impeccable leadership in each other a graceful leadership with each other and, and I know we can do that I have great optimism that we can bring this for each other and I think what you're about to see talks about how hard it is but that the possibility that we can is what we're birthing. So thank you for watching and thank you for being in this moment with me and all of us. And I wish you love and joy. Thank you. Something going well and something not going so well. And um, both of my biggest ones uh, are in relationship with Roger. And I think they're really indicative of something that if we can get this right in the movement, and we, I feel like we're really close.
something's going to massive's going to shift and it's already big right there's been a lot of healing over this last period um, with wisdom keepers to do with the masculine and feminine and I could talk at length about that and won't suit everybody so I'm not going to I mean, it's a shame Ronan's not here he calls uh, me and Roger the sun and the moon um, <laughs> and then, you probably people have heard this Genesis story of Extinction Rebellion that comes from, from my perspective from a prayer <laughs> asking for the team and asking for the codes for social change and then meeting Roger who finishes a four hours meeting saying here's the codes for social change <laughs> um, so so here's the good one so um so we're getting uh, agitated phone calls back in the office about the pink boat and how it's been removed. And probably quite a few people heard this story. Um, the, pink, the pink boat's been taken by the police and it's on the back of a van and it's off. And uh, it's, it's getting really tense out there, right? And, um, and we're like, look, it's up to the people on the ground. It's not us, you know, it's decentralized. And the phone calls keep coming in. And so eventually it's like, well, somebody get the fuck down here who's known to the movement needs to be Gail or Roger. And Roger and I jumped on a bike each, and pedaled. Like, it was, it's definitely going in the movie, that scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and beforehand, I'm looking around for a loud hailer or so all the fucking batteries are flat. There's nothing working in the office. I find a green horn and stick it in this belt. And we get there and lock the bikes up. And it's, the energy has shifted. There is uh, at least 1,200 police around, and they've got that kind of energy. And I would say our people are moving into it, felt like quite a mob energy building. Somebody's just tried to get on the boat, he's been thrown to the ground and there's a knee on his head. And I go up and try and do the peace, love, respect thing, and the police officer shoves me. I'm like, okay. And Roger says to me, uh, well, it's actually quite funny what you said to me. He goes, um, Gail, I'll talk to the police. You deal with the public. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking it's our fucking people. Anyway, um, and Roger goes off to talk to the police. And um, one of the things about Roger is that he will absolutely do what he believes right no matter what, no matter what shit he gets for it, no matter how much he gets attacked for it, mm. and one big piece of that has been holding this line about how we talk to the police. And there was a lot, uh, it's just one thing, that came Roger's way off the back of that. It can be very vicious, very, you know, if we want to use that language, very, uh, in my opinion, it's all my perspective, very much, um, where people are projecting sort of father stuff and wounds about the masculine. It's all in the room, right? And uh, I know it doesn't sit easy on Roger being like in trouble. And you're in trouble a lot, right? <laughs> a lot. And you will still fucking do it, right? He, he just is going to do it anyway. And uh, anyway, so Roger goes off to talk to the police. And I'm stood in front of this mob like crowd. And I think what I want you to know, first of all, is where the yin is, or whatever the language you want to use, for that moment for me. Because it was a deeply spiritual moment for me, because I'm stood in front of this crowd and I had two thoughts. One is, this, if it goes wrong, is the end of the rebellion. So, you know, this is a real significant moment of it turning into something that we didn't want. And it's entirely down to me to sort it out. That was my first thought. I knew you were doing the police, but with the people. And the second thing was, I don't know what to do. And I just stood there for a second, and I took this bloody green horn out. Um, and and I, I, I pray in a way I don't really fully understand for guides and allies. And uh, there's one that that sort of felt like it related to. Blew this horn three times, and some had just dropped in. And I felt very guided. And it's videoed this, so you'll see it at some point if you haven't. And to cut quite a long story short, what happened there was a really deep piece of um, people's assembly. I sort of understood that the boat was a symbol for what we don't want to let go of, 
and the place where we feel like we have to hang on to things. And I made this point to the crowd that we can let things go and we can have wisdom because we're going to have to get some wisdom. And we did this people's assembly. Bloody Jenny's glued herself to the road again. <laughs> Jenny and the group. Uh, it went on for a long time. Uh, people start to speak and it was a spontaneous happening. Um, and April brings forward a beautiful song. And somebody says, ooh, cultural appropriation. And April goes, it's a Shetland morning song. <laughs> and um, eventually we take a vote and we're letting the boat go. But I also say, you know, who didn't want to let the boat go? Two people, let's honour them, let's not have group think. And I think a, another significant moment for this movement is that a woman of Latino heritage needs to stand up and point out that yet again, in all the sharing, we've not honoured the losses in the global south. That was not in the speech. Yet again, a person of colour had to hold that for us. We're all mourning the bees and, and what's coming, but not that piece. I think that's the most, one of the most significant bits, is the most significant bit for this movement going forwards. Anyway, we let this boat go in a really beautiful way with the singing and the piece of it and uh, we, you get stuck behind an Amazon van and so on but um, <laughs> the police are really chill and, uh, and, when, and when they go it's like a carnival of police and everybody starts that chant police we love you it's for your children too and then we immediately get this phone call that says um, they've already retaken Oxford Circus uh, they've got a massive ban they've got all these pink boat hats and a massive banner saying we are the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and I think at some point it's captured on video, you just go to me like, we're a good team girl, aren't we? <laughs> and um, there's there's a depth there in the in the in without going on, you know, with the feminine, with instinct, with trust, with togetherness. And what I would say is the paradigm shift that has to happen now. Like, we won't win, and this is why I wonder where we might be different, and what I really want to be heard on is, like, we're not going to win this moment, this big thing in humanity, without shifting a paradigm, because all the other movements failed, because they didn't shift the paradigm, both internally and with the economic system. They just won some games. We can't just win some games, because it's so significant, without banging on about that. So, um... And, and sometimes I wonder the extent to which Roger understands that piece in the way I understand it and the vision holding team understands it and it feels marginalised. And it shouldn't have to be that Roger gets, it doesn't really matter. Like I really feel your spirit around the way you express existentialism uh, and what you've taught me about narcissism in our movement. Uh, it feels very spiritual to me, I don't really mind how you feel it and call it. Um, okay, so, and there's a piece of anteal consciousness and, and the shift there that I think is just so important. Um, so a piece to do with it not going well was like immediately after the rebellion, Roger's, Roger's energy is just, I don't, it's like a fucking Duracell bunny. I don't know where you get it from. <laughs> He's like, we're doing elections and, 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 and the Seafro thing. And so straight off the back of the rebellion, when everybody's fucking exhausted, he's got the next plans. And I write a mail going, whatever happens, just then we need to have the space for the debris, for the regen, uh, you know, for strategizing. And Roger's like, yeah, yeah, but I just want to do this experiment, Gail. And I was like, it's not a fucking toy anymore. It, it, there's, there's, there's this, this movement, it's like a young child, it needs to be held and we need to raise it, you know? And, um, and this is the side when it's not working. It's like, you're just fucking doing it anyway. And I, and I you know, I don't expect I don't know, like, partly I'd love to be heard, and also partly it's what, it's what we do that matters more, because, in my opinion, Roger's like that, and it's how we hold that as a group. And I don't want to be lobbied and, t and this and that, no, no, no. It sometimes feels like it's real shadow stuff, 
because it's like we need to get rid of it and it's like what bit of ourselves are we trying to get rid of here to do with integrating a really healthy masculine I think it's actually much more about how we constellate how we set systems up and in that way I'm just really honouring Frida for really working really hard to get this piece around how actions come forwards because that's really 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 important and I uh, the reason why we're here where we are, in my opinion, perspective, others may have difference, is Roger's energy of driving, and he will not stop, <laughs> probably, unless we fucking grab hold of him, and, so, and that has to, and, and, and we'll go round stuff, if it's not, if it's not how it is, and, 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 and sometimes it can even be a dishonesty in that, and there are people who have left because of it, and I don't, I just... I don't know, I, I personally feel quite at some peace with it, because I just think, it's who you are, you know? It's, I, I, it's, it's what's made things happen, and um, like, it's not really about making it about a person, it's the system. And uh, I think we can constellate together to get this bit right. And for me, it's about defining external program, actions and political, constructive program like Gandhi, internal, regen, SOS systems, conflict, that stuff, movement of movement, and at the centre holding it with vision and um, messaging, comms, strategy. And Roger and I need to be there together, not in different teams. Um, Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. And I just wanted to know what you thought. <laughs> uh, I, when we even talked earlier, actually, and I sort of said this to Roger, when he's talking about this bit and this bit, and then when the constructive program and how you said it and regen, it's like, mm, regen. Because mm. <laughs> I don't think it's felt, because I don't think your energy needs it. But it's just to understand, I think that's the bit maybe with the diversity here is like not really feeling how much people need that but it's not just a need in people it's not just about resting it's about creating a new way that's the piece why it's so exciting that's the new democracy you know that's the, that's we're creating it and like you know roger's innovation around tell the truth act, act has people to act accordingly that's held by um, what's called uh, emergency mode messaging, but also has vision, it needs vision in it. Um, uh, and um, the piece about Citizens Assembly, it came from Roger, it needs, it's brilliant, fucking genius actually, and it needs the People's Assembly piece in it, because that's what leads us into the new ways. So um, I just think it's really exciting if we get that bit right, but it just has to be understood, this man is a fucking maverick, and we'll get up to all sorts unless we've just got him, you know, in a good way, without, like, projection, you know. Just grab his fucking collar up when it's necessary. <laughs> say, whoa. That's what I want to say. It's been painful, actually. It's been pa isn't it? Right? Holding it and getting called the Roger Kratz, the, you know, the fucking enablers or whatever it is. It's painful. It's like a perspective. Yeah? I mean, it's hard, isn't it, Claire? And uh, oh, because we're trying to, oh, yeah, it's messy. And this is it. We get this bit right, I think. And the other piece, the global south, because we're just mostly white here. That's the. That's what I think. Thank you. Well, I, I, I haven't got a story. I just want to say a few things, if that's all right, in response. So, um, I, I want to say, first of all, that me and Gail are extremely different, in case you haven't realised that yet. <laughs> and I disagree with Gail on more or less everything, but, <laughs> uh, but not everything. And um, I'm not quite sure what you agree on, but... Um, but it's a peculiar relationship and it actually works really well and I've had hardly any fallings out with Gail and I'm not quite sure why but, um, uh, but I suppose 
one reason might be because we both know that the other person is is like actually right a lot of the time <laughs> but we don't want to admit it <laughs> um, because we've both had a lot of pain in our lives so you get used to realizing that you're a twat sometimes and that gives you a bit more maturity maybe and the other thing is that um, I think we understand each other's strengths and we don't need to talk to each other that much to get on with stuff and I think there's also a deep uh, element of mutual respect that basically the other person does a lot of stuff that I'm not very good at or I do stuff that she's not very good at. So I think the moral here, which I know is a bit naff, but you know, teams are great when they involve really different people as long as there's respect between them. And the most productive experiences in my life have been full of creative conflict with people in groups. Uh, and I think that's a, maybe a model for XR. So that's one thing I want to say. The thing I sort of, to explain my, uh, what else do I want to say? Yeah, okay. So the other thing that I want to say is, is, is that I think the reason why Extinction Rebellion has been as successful as it has been is because the people that set it up were sort of diametrically opposed to a lot of the conventional wisdom in activist culture that has been going on for 30 years. And we are all heretics, you know, to a certain extent. And we came together to basically recreate what it means to be an activist on the basis of the social science and on the basis of spiritualities and various other inputs. And, and there's a certain brutality in that because we went out into the public sphere and said, if you don't like it, then start your own social movement. We didn't explicitly say that, but it was like, this is the deal. You know, we're post-consensus. We respect each other. We're going to do mass civil disobedience. We're going to take the system down. All these things are things that are really controversial in other contemporary movements. And I think the, the story there basically is sometimes you have to go against the crowd in order to lead the crowd to you know, sanity. And I see that on a social level as well, what we're saying to our communities and to the nation and to the global community is if you follow the herd, we're all gonna die. And um, here's a new model. And obviously it's not the only model and it's only a good enough model, but it's a lot better than the suicide pact that we have at the moment with the system. So I suppose that explains why I, I'm quite uh, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I truly believe some things work and some things don't. And I'm not at a stage in my life where I'm willing to compromise on what I definitely know works and doesn't work because there's too much at stake and I don't want to die knowing that I compromised in something that doesn't work, which is potentially a really arrogant thing, of course. So I'm in constant conflict with myself on whether to push something knowing people will say I'm being pushy or, or not. And no doubt I have got it wrong sometimes and I will be getting it wrong, but my proposition is that I've got quite a lot of things right and it's really difficult for me to say that because I'm quite, uh, I don't like loads of attention and stuff and I like to be on the back side, of, you know, on the, I don't like talking to everyone now for instance, it's a bit uncomfortable, but I think like I've, I've had to push myself a lot to get, put, put myself into a position where a lot of people don't like what I'm doing because I don't want to see my kids die, I don't want to see my community die or this nation die. And, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer and I'm em emotionally attached to my land in a way that a lot of people don't understand because they haven't done weeding for 20 years, <laughs> you know. But that's, that's my life, really. It's not, it's not London, it's like, that's what I'm here to do. So for me, it's like a job. And uh, 
So, did, so um, yeah, and the third thing I wanted to say was that um, I, I, the other thing I'm really conflicted about is how important Roger Hallam is and how important I'm just part of the team. And do I have a special contribution to make? You know, like I've just been talking to my mate here about like having a personal assistant. <laughs> And you know, it's like that really grates culturally because, as some of you know, like you know, I'm coming from an anarchist background and what have you, and that would be a total no no when I was 21. And now part of me is just saying, fuck it, I need someone to sort out my emails. You know, I can talk to this billionaire this week, I've got three more billionaires to talk to, I can do massive leverage stuff for the movement. And is it such a compromise for someone to? sort my emails out or something, do you know what I mean? I've got one already, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got one already, so I'm going to keep up. So I'm not sure, but I, I, so I want to apologise to everyone when I get that balance wrong, but I want people to know that I'm, well, I don't, a day doesn't go back by when I don't think about it. And, and it's often really painful for me because I hate to be criticised, I'm quite sensitive, <laughs> even though I get on with stuff, but I'm not going anywhere, just deal with it, and I can deal with it. And, um, and I think I would invite, and I think the same with Gail, is in so much as we do need leaders, and in so much as you want other leaders, and I don't know the answer to those questions then, I think it'd be nice to have a, like a middle ground. I hate people saying I'm great, I just find it really embarrassing, to be honest. <laughs> But I really, really hate people being shitty to me when they don't really know what's going on. So I would invite trying to create some middle ground process where like this guy here, whose name I forgot because I forget everyone's name so everyone knows. Yeah, this one here, Jamie. Jamie. Yeah, just I, I did actually we had this little chat and I would welcome that, like, fucking give me your words, do you know what I mean? Like, let's have a meeting where you want to talk to me or Gail or whatever, we do two hours and people say what's on their mind and we can respond to it, rather than have a sort of, someone said this about you. <laughs> you know, fuck, really? <laughs> so, you know, and then you just decide whether you want me in the job or not, sort of thing, or whatever it is. So, that's, and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> What's that supposed to say? I think it's perfect. She, she's great, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, do people have things they want to say to us? I feel like that would be healthy now. Can I just hear what Roger would say about the global south? Because you didn't reference it and you said that was important to you. Just what, what how, how it fits in with the game so. Um, okay, so I'll tell you a little story. So when I was 18, like, I thought I was like bees knees like you do when you're 18. And I'd seen it all, and I was world weary and what have you. Uh, I hadn't seen it all. And I, Methodist Church paid me to go to India, and being radical guys, they had me like going to a civil rights group, and it was in Raipur in India. And the day before I arrived, like nine workers had been shot by the police, and then the police, there was a textile strike, and the police <coughs> and the police went into the villages and raped the women of the workers. And because he was a Gandhi guy, he'd sent out a, a fact-finding mission, and all the fact-finding mission had been arrested, and they were all in prison. So he just sent out a second one, and they'd all been arrested. And this guy, this sick 1968 guy, he had a big black beard, I remember him. He had his amazing eyes and he just looked at me, you know, didn't have to say anything. I was just full of determination and everything that I needed from a guru figure at that age. And he, he said to me, Roger, like, your role is to go back to your country and take down the government. So that's my, my mode of operation for the last 30 years, is to work in this country to, to do whatever we can to prevent the structural you know, genocidal bollocks system that we have and and that's that's my agenda. So, you know, but I don't shout about it. <laughs> yeah. Um if 
thing that didn't work was rest time after the rebellion for regen. Um, is that something you could make an agreement wouldn't happen again? Like, as in to do it, like if there is a, when the next rebellion happens, that there, Roger, you feel you could support the fully the regen time happening? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just really frustrated that there wasn't a very uh, organised and systematic like structure to what happened after the rebellion. So there was a lot of confusion <coughs> around it, and I happened to be all into people having rest time to the extent that it's needed for people, and and having a proper debrief. And I put my bit of paper that should be compulsory. To, for people to go, if people take part in the next rebellion in October, like part of the contractual agreement is everyone participates in structured debrief afterwards. So I've got a problem with that. I, I mean, the reason I went off to do the election campaign was one, because they didn't really know what was happening. And secondly, because as Cale said, I'm a bit mad and I like to go and prototype things and it was a good opportunity. So, uh, but I apologize that that caused some confusion you know, uh, in, in, in for various people, uh, and I certainly wouldn't do it again. I mean, the reason why is because we only had 24 hours notice to get it together. So, in the normal, it's like structurally determined, if you see what I mean. It wasn't like, hey, let's create an election. It was like there was one there, so you had to go for it. Well, not, of course, as the case may be. But, um, yeah, and one of my, this is a broader frustration I have with the structure, and hopefully this whole meeting is gonna help things along. Is, is the whole strategic process has to be a book in front of the curve rather than behind it, so that I'm not, or, or Larch or anyone else, it's obviously it's not just me, but it's various people that have to, we've been dragged along by events, you know, mm. like Brussels have already set the rebellion for next April, right? Mm. You know, if XR doesn't get strategically on the ball, it'll be left, events are gonna, it's not about me, you know, there's about to be a world revolution next year or two, right? People don't want to die. So if XR doesn't want to lead it, someone else is going to take that forward. So, you know, we're perfectly capable of doing it. We just need some strategic orientation. So just to respond briefly, yeah. I think if there's not enough money and resources in the back office, we can't get ahead of the curve because I'd say that's the critical piece to being resourced to actually do the catch up and then to be able to start thinking about the future and be ahead of you guys is like money, resources and people need to flow into back office functions that enable planning and forward motion <coughs> would be my suggestion. And if you guys can sort that out, then I would love to help. Um, is that push and pull? And um, I just want to know where you get your information from, each of you, about what's happening right at the tips of the movement. So, like, say the de decision about Heathrow, uh, a lot of the kind of like worry around it was taking energies from people who didn't have the energy, or like people saying, like, like we didn't plan after rebellion to have a good debrief process. We also didn't have like an RST support system in place and things like that. And so when you do something, it draws resources and energies from lots of people. So I want to know how it is, both of you, get your information and who it is you trust to have the finger on the pulse of the broader movement to know if they have the energy for different things. And where, who you trust to say, actually, we need to not do this because this group here needs some more attention and needs more energy before we move forward. So how do you get that information and who do you trust? You can start if you like. Um, I try and check in on base camp. I know it's not necessarily at the edge and I know it's some specifically loud voices, that's one way. Um, but I think uh, a really big issue for XR is getting a proper feedback system in place and that the people that um, are down to do that are doing too many other jobs and look not in a good place to mm. me anyway. But. Um, but it, um, we've been new, started to use the newsletter and get more sy systematic in asking for feedback. Um, but what tends to come, quite a lot of it comes my way. I get messaged by people saying this is happening in Cornwall, this is 
And that's where I then find it difficult to get on with what I want to do, which is the strategy. Things had been sent a bit, you know, there was a post April how to do a strategy process paper that I'd written. And then what I'm doing instead is fielding all this other stuff and then phone calls and stuff. So that's, that's why it's, it's like personally tricky for me. It does, it does come in my direction. Mind you, is anyone or any way avenues that you trust to give you input into whether or not? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> Just dream it up one morning. <laughs> <laughs> Do actually. But anyway, uh, yeah, well, it's not like XR has been going for years, so there's no like process, you know, it's like everything's new, isn't it? So it's not so. You know, the whole thing around EFA is a bit unique in some ways. But anyway, the upshot of it is is I'm a coordinator of the action strategy team or whatever we call called now, action circle thing. And so some people will talk to me about actions and I'll modify them or with Larch as my co-coordinator or with uh, Claire or whatever, a few of us will come together. Well, then we'll put a proposal forward, we get some feedback about it then it goes out and then you get more feedback and now it's systematised because Freedom One or two other people have systematised it. Um, so that's like the easy answer. But the more difficult answer is this isn't really a social movement, it's an emergency mobilisation. That's how I see it. So it's different to, it's not like, hey, we're just trundling along. It's not like C&D in 1970. It's not like, you know, it's not like we've got three or four years just to... So for me, and this is obviously the reason I get into trouble potentially, is for me there is an objective mobil there's an objective mobilisation plan that we we need to be pursuing or that I see was pursuing and a big part of that is the top of the curb mobilisation which is several hundred people going to prison that has to happen in that has to happen quick otherwise for me there's no credibility around the notion there's a, a there's a there's a, a climate emergency is going to kill billions of people so. For me, like, like obviously, I'm in that tension because I'm, 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 I see myself as creating one of the people that's creating that that structure to this emergency mobilisation, and obviously the pushback is, hey, it's a movement and we're not ready yet, you know. But in any, you know, existential emergency, you know, you'll have that conflict. You know, look at the French Resistance or something. You know, they didn't have a day off because they were facing the Nazis. So for me, like. That's the tension. It's like the mo in you know, fr from a certain hippie point of view, as it were. Then obviously I'm some bad guy that's rushing off ahead. But you know, from another point of view, it's like we're in a narcissistic individualist culture where everyone has to, you know, as soon as something tricky happens, you have to take ten days off, you know, to caricature something, you know. But I'm from a tradition where you know you get up in the morning and you get on with the job. So I'm not saying that's right or wrong. But I'm just saying that's the tension, and you know I'm being clear with everyone. I am gonna go and you know unless there's act of God, I am gonna go and get arrested at Heathrow. Period. Do you see what I mean? Because I'm in resistance against genocide, and that's the best way of doing it. And if they put me in prison, so be it. You know, I've made my peace with that a long time ago, and I'm presenting to that movement as a critical mass in the movement that wants to do it, and I'm hoping that the movements. <coughs> going to go cool you know people want to do that right um, and obviously that's not the whole that's not the whole picture there's loads of really valid things and I'm try to uh, you know I'm respectful of all that and at the end of the day you know you've got to do something very dramatic very quick so there we are that's a bit of tension isn't it yeah, thank you okay, just a response to that one briefly yeah there's, um, there's another tension that I might be, and I think we haven't reached agreement on this, and so it's just good to have it all, and it doesn't matter that everybody agrees, right, but uh, when Roger first tabled his paper, it was at Ian Bray's house, I think it was January 2018, and I think uh, quite a few of us said we're not ready, we want to rewrite the principles of values, and um, some of us said we're really worried about eco-fascism, because when there's a sense that there's an emergency, that the, the right are grabbing onto it, they're getting it. Uh, and there's that point of, as Dougald Hines said from um, Dark Mountain, do we want, on the basis of emergency, do we want less democracy or more? And that's the fascism route. 
that, you know, you can solve this crisis by releasing a virus that kills most of the population by saying fuck Africa with geoengineering and um, building some, do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a, I don't want to live on that planet. So for me, that piece that says more democracy, the paradigm shift is absolutely essential. So, the, so when I'm talking about the constructive program, I'm not talking about having a fucking day off to be indulgent or, you know what I mean? But I'm talking about as building this program that is the new world because I'm not up for the fascism. And I, 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 I think that's absolutely essential. We get our heads around that as a movement, actually. It's just another tension in the room. So, so, thank you for that. Um, so we're going to have to round off very soon. I'm just going to invite those that are more quiet whilst Jane just says something. If there's a question for those that don't usually speak that would like to say something, please have a look inside now. Um, whilst Jane says something, and then we'll come to those last remarks, and then we're going to round off. It would be nice to hear from a female voice because yeah. everyone who's spoken so far has been male. And Nina. And Nina spoke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Mostly male. Just, just whilst everyone's having a question, you just have a no, no, I, I, I don't. I mean, it was really just hearing you say that as, as, as an outsider or whatever. It just feels strange. But I don't think there's any, like, you know, I know it, from a certain way of saying it, it sounds like there's a tension. But what you, you guys are all about is firing an arrow in the most efficient way possible. And in order to fire the arrow, you have to pull the bow back and you have to aim it. So it's not days off. Um, you're both wanting to fire the same arrow. I mean, I'm not saying you both, you're representing the conversation of the duality at the moment, but you know, everybody wants to fire the arrow. It's, I don't see it as two different things, this thing. I just think it's like a bow and arrow, it works through pulling it back, which is, you could say is the regenerative stuff, so that you've got time to go, is this where I want to pass? You know, before you even fire the arrow, you take a moment of stillness to go, do I want to fire this arrow? Or is this the right direction for the arrow? You know, those are the things, they're not, they're not like regenerative in the sense of we need to relax so that we've got more energy. And I know that you, Roger, have got like endless energy. So you may not need to rest, but you definitely need to aim. And so I just wanted to say, I don't think there's a division. I just think there's one bow and arrow and it, it's, it's one process. It's not this or that. That's just what I'm saying. Thank you. It's not a question statement and response and um, as some of you know I'm not part of XR but like all of you I've been doing the same hours for the last six months and I, you will probably edit this bit out because what I need to say is that my heart sinks listening to this conversation my heart sinks listening to this conversation I thought there was a chance for XR to look at some of the dynamics at its heart and to reevaluate them and potentially reconstellate those. And what I've experienced in the last half hour is a reaffirm, reaffirming of the narrative, the reaffirming of a white saviour narrative. And you know I love you, Gail, but I'm not saying this directly at you. I'm talking about the system here. I'm not talking about individuals. Um, and I feel angry and I just feel almost despair about that so you will want to edit that out but that's where I am and it's not me can like, you, it's can not you just say me. more about what bit <coughs> would you miss it well we know uh, that we know the people who are missing just by looking around the room you will all like I do know I'm, I'm trembling as I say this because I am angry about it um, you will all know a load of activists, experienced activists, who could really have helped shift this movement and this moment and helped build us into an organisation that really reflected the issues that lots of people are concerned about and that, that enabled everybody to show up, that enabled everyone to show up and step into their power. And I don't think that we've done that and I think that XR has missed an opportunity to do that. And I think that it's like it's. I it just I think that today and the, a couple of days ago, just for me, it reaffirms that oh no, there isn't a will to do that. There isn't a recognition of the depth of the issues around that here. 
So it's not like it's a dynamic, because often in the, with the individuals that I talk to around XR and that I support and that I work with, and the different teams, I can see those conversations happening and I can see that dynamic. When I look around this room and the responses to the things that get said in this room, I don't see that will, I don't see that energy for change. I see stasis, I see a few nods when I'm talking, but I mostly just see, actually, we're good, we're carrying on. We've named this, we've kind of processed it a bit, but essentially our model is what's gonna work. And I am telling you from the bottom of my heart, this model will not work. You need every form for this to work. And everyone doesn't feel welcome here at the moment.